Good morning and welcome. We're really pleased to see you this morning. I want to welcome those that are in the building, but also all those that are joining us online. Great to have you sharing with us today. And uh, thanks to Annalise and all the musicians for leading us to this point. Really good to uh, be able to share like that. Um, it is fairly cool and windy outside. We've made sure that it's nice and warm in here and hopefully it'll be warm a little bit out into the chats area afterwards so you can hang around and stay out of the wind. Quite happy that it's uh, today, not yesterday. Um, I coach uh, AFL teams, juniors, and uh, the three teams uh, that I coach, we played parents yesterday. So it was kids versus parents, or it's the uni cougars versus the codgers. Uh, that's what we usually say. Uh, there was only a difference yesterday between the three teams and their parents of around 300 points. Um, the parents did well in the first quarter, began to slow down very quickly after the second quarter, and with some creative umpiring, things just got away uh, from the parents. But um, a day like today out at the uni on that ground, let me tell you, is a different experience. So quite happy for it to be uh, uh, yesterday, a nice day. Today we get the comfort of sitting in here and enjoying this today. Last week, Jonesy launched this series called Disrupted. And he spoke about the fact that while we would all prefer lives that go according to plan, our plan, the reality is that disruptions come our way. Disturbances, problems, challenges, just things right out of left field that we couldn't have anticipated. And Jonesy mentioned that in this life, here on this broken planet, we don't have to go looking for disruptions. They find us. At times, those disruptions are on the minor end of the scale. But there are some disruptions that shake us to the core. There are major moments that sometimes define us. And our choices in those moments, our responses to those disruptions have significant consequences, not only for us, but many of those around us. Today, we turn our attention to Joseph, the Joseph, the earthly da dad of Jesus. And if you want to talk about major disruption, well, here it is. Matthew, one of Jesus' followers, closest followers, records it like this, this disruption that came into the life of Joseph. He says this in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Well, nothing like some major pre-wedding drama to shake things up. And in that time, in that culture, you could hardly get bigger drama. A betrothed young lady, a teenager, announcing to her fiancé that she was pregnant and he wasn't the dad. That's a disruption. Not how Joseph ever imagined things going. So let's just put this in context a little bit. The Apostle Luke tells us in the first chapter of his book, that a bit over three months prior to this disruption that we're looking at, that we've just uh, read about, God had already sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to Mary, to break the news to her that she was going to have a son. 
And this Holy One would be the Son of God Himself. Now that is mind-blowing stuff and we could spend a lot of time just looking at Mary's response to that news. But today we focus on Jesus, on Joseph, sorry. So here we have three-month pregnant Mary breaking her news to Joseph. How come God didn't send another angel at the same time as Gabriel was delivering his news? One angel to Mary and one for Joseph at the same time. When you think about the way it went down, it doesn't seem that fair. It's not fair on Mary as she had to go and deliver the news herself. Can you imagine that conversation? He has no idea. She turns up and says, surprise, I'm going to have a miracle baby. Not fair on Joseph. He's now having to deal with what could only appear to him as the unfaithfulness of the woman he's betrothed to marry. And how he handles this disruption has a lot to say about his character and I believe a lot to say to us. So I want to spend a few minutes carefully considering his response to the news. And I want to frame it with this question. If this story is true, this one that Matthew records for us, if this story about the birth of Jesus is true, and if God chose who was going to be the earthly parents of his beloved son, why would he choose Joseph? This carpenter who lived in a backwater town called Nazareth? Why him? What's so special about Joseph? For a moment, I want to pick up how Joseph is described by Matthew. He says this, Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Now, some translations render the description a just man or a man who is faithful to the law. But righteous man is accepted as an accurate translation of how Matthew was describing Joseph. Now, I want to say to you that over the years when I've read this account, I've often just thought righteous man meant good bloke, upstanding citizen, law-abiding man. But John Ortberg states that there is a great deal more to this term righteous man. And a New Testament scholar by the name of Scott McKnight has written extensively about this and he points out that the Hebrew word for righteous man is tasaku. Now the word is going to come up on the screen. I want you to understand that I actually approached someone who studied Hebrew to try to get the translation right. He said the, in, in that way, but then he said to me, here's what you need to do. Say it quickly, say it confidently, because who else is going to correct you? So... We're going to go with that pronunciation this morning. The spelling is up there. And if you want to correct me afterwards, knock yourself out. Joseph was a tasaku. And this means he was known in his community for his uncompromising obedience to the Torah. The law of Moses. The Torah was the law of God as revealed to Moses and recorded in the first four books of the Hebrew Scriptures. Joseph did not eat unclean food. He did not mix with the wrong kinds of people. He didn't keep his carpentry shop open on the Sabbath. He was a tasaku. That was his identity. Max Licardo states that Matthew recognises the status of Jesus, of, of Joseph, sorry. He recognises this status in his record. People in Nazareth viewed him as we in the church community might regard a very respected elder or deacon, a respected leader in our community. This was his standing in the community. But Mary's announcement jeopardised it. Mary's announcement put this at risk. Nazareth was a small town, and as a general rule, word gets around in a small town. 
So here we have this Tasuku and a pregnant fiancé in a small town. Joseph has a problem. His life, his plans, his hopes have been disrupted. And we need to get the part of his deal about him being a righteous man is that he has a strong commitment to the Torah. What the Torah says you do, that is who you are. And the Torah has some very clear instructions about what to do in Mary's condition. A section in Deuteronomy 22 covers marriage defilement. And it says this, if a woman is pledged to be married, and that's Mary, and this woman is found to be unfaithful, it says that she shall be brought to the door of a father's house and there the men of her town shall stone her to death. She has done a disgraceful thing in, in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house. You must purge this evil from among you. Now that sounds barbaric, very primitive. But that was the law in that day. Maybe Joseph thought she'd been seduced by another man. Well, in that case, the Torah made it very clear that both were to be stoned. And probably the quickest and easiest way of dealing with this disruption for Joseph was to go along with how most other Tasaku of that day might have dealt with it. Expose her sin. Let her be punished. That was probably the way that would allow him to keep his reputation, his standing intact in that community. But he didn't. He didn't. And I like that about Joseph. I like that in his example. Matthew 1 verse 19 literally says, Joseph being a righteous man, did not want to make a public example of her. Biblical scholars have debated how to translate being righteous, being a righteous man. And that verse can be understood because he was righteous. The idea here would be that because he is righteous, he doesn't want to cause any more pain or problems for Mary. But a New Testament scholar by the name of Dan Hagger states that it's also possible that the best translation is although he was a righteous man. Although he was a tasaku, a righteous man, he didn't want to see Mary's sin exposed. He didn't want to see her punished. Although he was in this position, regarded as a tasaku, he still didn't want to see this happen to this woman. The old way of viewing being a righteous man in that community would have demanded he exposed Mary and exposed her sin and that she then suffer the consequences. Standards had to be maintained. In the old system, righteousness separated itself from sinners and a righteous man wouldn't have hesitated. But Joseph hesitated. So he decides to try to divorce her quietly. A betrothal in those days was a legal act. So to end a betrothal required an act of divorce. Doing it quietly was about minimising her suffering, protecting her, even though in Joseph's mind, she had caused him to suffer. And then in verse 20, God finally steps in and sends a message to Joseph. And it says this, after he had considered this, the idea of divorcing her quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So why did God make Joseph wait till after he had to think and struggle with all this stuff? Why couldn't an angel come to him ahead of time, explain everything and remove all the struggle and the anxiety? John Ortberg, again in a sermon entitled Recognising Divine Interruptions, suggests, is it possible 
that anxiety removal is not God's number one goal for Joseph or maybe for you and me? Is it possible that in getting his world turned upside down, in having to struggle between what he thought a tasaku, a righteous man ought to do, and his longing to show compassion to this young lady. Maybe Joseph was being prepared by God to come to a new understanding of what righteousness is. Maybe what God was allowing to take place in Joseph's life was to help him to grow. And is it possible in your life right now, if you're confused, disoriented or uncertain. If disruption has come into your life, maybe it's not because you've done something wrong. Maybe you're about to grow. God acts and an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name of Jesus because he will save his people from, this, from their sins. The angel says, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Why would Joseph be afraid to wed Mary? Of course, Joseph would be afraid of offending God and violating the Torah. But maybe also Joseph would have been afraid of losing his reputation. He would be afraid that everyone would, what everyone would think about him. Joseph knew about his own doubts when Mary told him about the angel and the fact that she was now pregnant. And I think Joseph knew that if he married Mary, the people of that community would never accept his account of what had happened. He wouldn't be invited to all the gatherings anymore. He may lose some business. He would never be admired and respected again as a righteous man in his own community. If Joseph committed himself to this baby, to this one who was going to be known as Jesus, he would do so at enormous sacrifice. His reputation would be gone. But Joseph chose to do what the angel had commanded him. He did two things. In verse 24, he took Mary home as his wife. In those days, taking her into his home was a legal step. It meant that he was publicly claiming her from that point on as his wife. And then in verse 25, it says that he named the baby. I had never, ever realized what a big statement that was. He named the baby. This too is a legal action. In the act of naming the child, Joseph was publicly adopting this child as his son. And his choices, his decisions cost him. There were consequences. Part of the price that Joseph paid may be seen in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. When the people are talking about Jesus, they say, isn't this the son of Mary? Now, there may be a chance that Joseph was dead at that time. He had passed away by that time. But even if the father had died, a man in Israel was always referred to as the son of his father. Jesus bar Joseph. To refer to the man as the son only of the mother was often a harsh expression. It was an insult. Mark 6 verse 3 may reflect that decades later, Joseph's reputation still not had, had not recovered from his choice to marry Mary. Again, it is John Ortberg who states this. Maybe God decided that Jesus, who would be called a friend of sinners, should be raised in a family that knew firsthand what it feels like to be regarded in the spiritually second-class category. Maybe part of why Jesus had a heart for unrespectable people is that he was raised by a father who had sacrificed his respectability for his son. 
may be one reason Jesus had compassion on women who were walking scandals is that he knew what it meant to his mother, that his father had stuck by her when she was single and pregnant and when all the righteous folks would have said, take a walk. I think of how Jesus, as he was growing up, must have known of his father's example and known of his father's courage. When this Jesus was a grown man, he basically confronted previous ideas about righteousness. And he said, unless your righteousness passes that of Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the old system, the old way of viewing righteousness, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus had seen a better kind of righteousness. God still calls people to be willing to die to reputation and status and comfort for the sake of love. Maybe when Joseph made the decision to wed Mary, he thought it would be the end of him being known as a righteous man. But perhaps what God had in mind was to redefine, to redefine what a truly righteous man looks like. Let me return to the question I posed earlier. If this story is true, this birth story of Jesus, and God chose the parents who were going to raise his beloved son, the earthly parents of Jesus, why would he choose Joseph? There are some things that come to mind as I ponder that question, but this morning I'm only going to share one. I believe that as we read that account in Matthew, one of the things that stands out for me, that it, when disruption happened in Joseph's life, he didn't lose sight of the other person. Even as his world was being turned upside down, he didn't lose sight of Mary. However he was going to respond would impact her, and he knew that. And the fact that he understood that was going to be part of his decision-making, his thinking. And so he ponders and he considers divorcing her quietly. And that was about how he could care for her, minimise the harm to her. In spite of his hurt, disappointment and sense of loss, he refused to go down the line of revenge or punishment. He still chose to be concerned for her well-being. He still expressed compassion and love for this woman who turned his life upside down. He didn't lose sight of Mary and he saw her as a person of worth. The message paraphrase of the verses in Matthew 1 states this, Joseph chagrined. And that word means humiliated, displeased and hurt. Joseph chagrined, but noble. He was decent, self-sacrificing, not petty, determined to take care of things quietly so Mary would not be disgraced. I like it that Joseph, despite how he may have perceived Mary's treatment of him, chose to be noble. What a quality. I'm not sure about you, but I've met people who when things start to happen that are not in accordance with how they perceive they should be, when disruption comes, quickly drift from grace. They begin to kind of turn and turn on others. When others fail or disappoint them or even hurt them, they go back to the rules really strongly and they go back with a vengeance. The rules become a weapon, a weapon to punish, a weapon to teach people lessons. And they do it with our compassion or care for the other. Can I say to you that that is not the example of Joseph? In the midst of our disruption, in the midst of disruptions that come our way, 
Our choice is always to do life with God or to do life without Him. We always have a choice to include Him or exclude Him. Joseph chose in the midst of disruption to put his trust in God. And that was seen in the choices that he made. He listened and he obeyed. He took Mary in and he took on the role of the earthly father of Jesus. He obeyed no matter the cost. Jones is right. In this life, we don't have to go looking for disruptions. They will find us. So I want to encourage you this morning when they come, Look to God. Seek Him. Ask Him what it is that He wants you to learn or grow in. Be open where that takes you and be open with who it takes you to. Look beyond yourself. Be aware that others are around you and your sponsors in that time will have an impact on them. This is important. Because it's easy when disruptions come to become self-absorbed, even sorry for ourselves. And we take our eyes off our God and it becomes all about us. Do your best to trust God in the face of disruption. Believe that obedience to his way of handling things will always lead somehow and somewhere to real benefits. Lots has been written, sung and said about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and rightly so. However, my encouragement to you this morning is to take another look at this man called Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. To look at his compassion and care in the face of the disruption that he faced. To understand what it would mean for him. And to understand that this wrestle, this struggle that he faced would have been significant and had major consequences when he finally made his choice. It is easy sometimes to let go of compassion and care, to become so locked in at getting things fixed that we forget to care and we forget to show compassion. Joseph's example, Joseph's example is a man who was noble. A man who showed compassion, care in the midst of disruption. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we all face times where things don't kind of work out the way we hoped where we face things that come into our lives that we'd rather not have there. In those times, I pray that we will remember the example of Joseph. Father, I pray that we would remember that our choices and our responses have an impact on us, but also on others. And so in those times, we will choose to be noble. We will choose to be kind. We will show compassion and care. And most of all, I pray that in those times when things sometimes seem to be spinning out of control, we will look to you. We will ask you to help us in those times to learn and to grow. To learn what it is that you want us to know, but more than that, to learn what it is who you want us to become. So, Father, we pray that you would continue to guide us, that you would help us in this area. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.